In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, we have the Great Commission. One of, if not the, the very last phrases, definitely at least along the last few minutes of Christ's time on this earth. The Son of God, perfect, holy, sinless, sacrificial death on the cross, resurrected in a bodily form, appeared back to the disciples and many, many others, and, and, and now he's about to leave and go back to heaven forever. He's about to leave and... and um, we know that, that they're on a mountain toward the end of the time here. He's actually going to be r lifted up the mountain and rise back to heaven from the mountain. He's talking to the disciples now and giving some last kind of instructions, some last thoughts. They must know that, that at some point this leaving is going to take place. They don't know that this is the final time because we find out in Acts that, that the angels who talk to them after this happen say, why do you stand here gazing to the heavens? The Son of Man, he went this way, he'll come back the same way. So they didn't know he was going to be gone forever at this point, but they knew that there was a, the time was drawing short. No doubt in my mind that, that Christ knew about the timing of it, and, and definitely in his mind there was a, a heaviness, or a, and not a heaviness, but a sense of importance to what he is saying to them. Of course, everything that Christ said was important, but at the end now, to give them a last charge or a last commission... They have in the Navy what is called commissioned officers. My brother is one of those officers. Not just enlisted, but, but a commissioned officer. They're given a charge and, and has a commissioning or, or a rank. The commissioning of officers has a long history and can be, can be traced back to the Roman Empire. During the Middle Ages, sovereigns would offer noblemen commissions to raise armies to protect the realm. And the commission was always a lawful extension of a sovereign's power. You see, this morning as we look at the Great Commission, we're looking not just at a great suggestion, a great instruction, but a commission from the sovereign of the universe, none other than God himself, giving to us a truth, a charge, a duty, an obligation, not just to me as a pastor. Not just to our assistant pastors, Pastor Goldemez and, and Pastor Ryan or Pastor Dylan or, or Pastor Cowling. Not just to our, to our staff who work in the school or, or staff who work in the office. And not just to those who are in church, but to every single Christian. Every single Christian, those who have been saved, are receiving this commission. The Great Commission. Matthew 20, 19 and 20. The Bible says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time. Lord, I'd ask that you would give, please, upon me your spirit and help. Help me to say those things that would be profitable the things that would, Lord, challenge and be correct to your and true to your word. Lord, I ask that your spirit would touch us this morning, that your word would convict us, and we'd respond the way we ought to. We'd respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We have these verses called the Great Commission. You know, when I say turn to Matthew 28, of course, many of you have, have heard this passage before. And, and sometimes you have these kind of thoughts. Oh, no, it's just another soul-winning message. Let me make sure I have some tracks. And, and it's good. We should, ought to have tracks with us. We ought to be soul-winning. We ought to be witnessing. Amen? Okay, just thought you're still awake out there. We ought to be giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> we ought to be giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This commission encompasses so much. There's so much power inside of what Christ has for us, so much instruction inside of it. If we're not careful, we will fall back into a lazy habit, an unused habit. The life of the church, the life of the church is found in these verses right here. The life of the church. There are churches out there who haven't seen a visitor or someone saved coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ or someone baptized in decades and decades I mentioned you before but when I first came to work at a small church when I was in Greenville South Carolina 
in the baptistry was Christmas decorations. I'm thankful that we can lift that screen up at the end of the service and there's water back there. That water is regularly moved by people getting baptized. This verse, these verses contain the life of the church. And if we're not careful, we become locked into our own little life, our own little pattern. And, and we think that this particular set of verses is, is for somebody else. And pastor, that's good for you. And you ought to do that. And I ought to do that. Amen. But, but it's far beyond me. You ought to do that. We ought to do this. The life of the church. If we're not careful, we will, be, we will become stale and lifeless because we missed the Great Commission. There's the illustration given where a small boy made a model of a boat. He glued it all together and worked on it for hours. And it was perfect. Every detail was correct down to the tiny sailors standing on the deck. He wanted to preserve this, this perfect little boat, so he put it into a glass case. He kept it there, mainly out of his brother's hands. It was the boy's parents, a little while after that, bought a real sailboat, a real boat. At first, they spent some weekends sailing on the harbor, and they loved it. But they realized there was a lot of work to maintain this, and as the story goes, and as some of you have testified to, the boat owner's best day of their life, or the happiest day of their life, is when they bought the boat, but the happier day was when they sell the boat. And at first, they used it a lot, but gradually they used it less and less. It was expensive, and... After a few months, they realized they hadn't used it for a while, so they decided to go sailing. As they went out to their boat that had not been touched in three or four months, as the story goes, they found that the motor was dead and the barnacles were going on the side and algae covered the inside. And it was unusable because it was not used. If we're not careful as Christians as a church, if we're not used, if we're not giving the gospel, we become stale and lifeless. We're not made as a model to be kept inside of a glass case. We're to be out in the community pouring ourselves into the lost, into the unsaved. We're to be out ministering to other people, serving Jesus Christ. That is the energy and the passion and the calling of the Great Commission. We'll look at this morning and break down this particular passage if we could. Right, first off, I see the expectation of this commission. The expectation. What does Jesus expect from us? Oh, I understand what someone says when I expect something. I have expectations for my children. My wife has expectations for me. She likes me to hang things. In fact, I was up late last night hanging things on the walls. So if you walk through our house, please notice the pictures that are hung on the wall. Thank you. If they're crooked, do not say anything to my wife about it, okay? Tell me, I'll switch it. We last night, I, it was our other house. My wife one morning said, she goes, would you hang a picture? To this day, I know she said a picture to me. Now, she said she didn't say a picture, but I know she said a picture to me. I walk out there, and she had one of these things that they found on that devil site called, oh, Pinterest. <laughs> Definitely of the devil himself. She found one of these things called, you may have heard it, ladies, a gallery wall. Yeah. If you didn't hear my wife, she said, oh, that's good. And, and they were in this picture. I think there were, I think I had 13 things to hang. 13. In one wall. I'm just one man. His grace is sufficient. His strength made perfect in my weakness. <laughs> oh, the expectation. We understand expectations. There's expectations everywhere you go, and you have expectations. You go to McDonald's, and you expect to have quick service and hot French fries. If for some reason they don't have hot french fries, you're like, why are you even in existence, McDonald's? Yesterday we stopped at McDonald's on the way back from a, a father-son retreat. And man, they were great french fries. And my boys and I were chowing down these french fries. And we're like, man, these are incredible. And, and I think one of my boys said, man, McDonald's, they make the best french fries. And I'm like, they're going to make a lot of money as long as they serve french fries just like this. All right, it, it is great. We have expectations. Jesus has an expectation for us through the Great Commission. What is that expectation? It's not just a suggestion. Too many Christians treat this passage of Scripture as a suggestion. Oh, that's a nice thought, Jesus. Oh, thank you very much for that. It's not a suggestion. It's, not a, it, it's a commission. It's a command. Years ago, there was a, a thought that we should just have what's called lifestyle evangelism. 
And what that looked like to that particular group of people who coined this phrase was that you never talk about Jesus, you just live Jesus. Now, we ought to live like Jesus Christ. Oh, boy, we're going to wake up here. Let me say it again. We ought to live like Jesus Christ. Every day, at home, at work, at school, pumping your gas, taking your trash out, you ought to live like Jesus Christ. But this thought was, the thought they coined was lifestyle evangelism. And what it meant was all you did was live like Jesus. You never said it. And eventually, someone will ask, well, why are you different? Now, I hope that when you live like Jesus, other people notice. That's the point of that. You're the salt of the earth. You're a light. You're a city. You're set on a hill. You can't be hid so that you glorify your Father, which is in heaven. But the Great Commission is far much more than just me living like Jesus Christ. There's an active, there's an activity, an active command to this. There are some that would say, well, the, the, the commission says, um, go ye therefore. And the first command is go. The, the fact is, if you really set it out, the go ye therefore is an implied command, not an implicit command. There's a difference there. In the Greek, it is, it, the command is not to go. The command is, is follow this. But let me explain it this way. Let's pretend that I'm a 16-year-old boy. I'm at home sitting on the couch. And my father walks into the living room. I'm on the couch. We're pretending this happens. And he says, J.D., cut the grass. Well, he didn't tell me to stand up. He didn't tell me to go outside. Well, where's the grass? Outside. Which grass do you think you want me to cut? The neighbor's grass? No. I could figure it out as a 16-year-old boy, right? Jesus is saying, go you therefore. What? He's saying, go. It's implied, you go, you go everywhere. You, you get out of your houses. You get out of your little buildings. You, you get out into the highways and the byways, a different illustration that Jesus used. And you go everywhere. Everywhere you go, people ought to know that you love Jesus Christ and that they need Jesus Christ in their life. What is go? Why? Why? The Bible says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach all nations. You're going to make disciples in where? Well, where is it? Where are you cutting the grass? Well, all nations. Where are the nations? They're around the world. They start next door at your neighbor. They go down the street and they go across the street and they go around the corner. Too often we have spiritual hermits. We're right here. I read an account of the, the most, one of the most famous hermits lately. He was caught in 2013. His name was Chris Knight. He wandered off into the woods, no one really knows why, in 1986. Caught in 2013, 27 years later. They ended up writing a book about him. He, he went to jail, not because he was a hermit. He went to jail because he lived off stealing other things. And apparently in the United States, you're not allowed to steal things. And he lived in the woods, and they had some pictures of his makeshift tent, and he had propane tanks there, and he had a nice tent. He had, I saw in one picture, he had a nice, one of those uh, camp coffee pots. And then it had some, some surveillance pictures of him breaking into stores and, and stealing things. He was a hermit. He wandered off. But I wonder if we look through this crowd today at First Baptist Church, how many spiritual hermits we have who are off in the woods all by themselves, Maybe not causing any problems, but not f fulfilling the expectation of the Great Commission. You see, Jesus commands me to go and teach all nations everything that Jesus said to do. Jesus commands me to go and teach all nations everything that Jesus told me or said for me to do. Not only is there an expectation of the commission, there's an explanation of the commission. What does it mean to teach all nations? Do I go and do I teach them English? ESL, English as a second language. Well, no, it's not what Jesus is talking about because he's not speaking this command in English. This time he's speaking in Greek. What did he mean to, to make them learn Greek? Well, this particular Greek in the New Testament is Koine Greek, and now it's a dead language, so it's probably not that. This word, to teach all nations, to teach, means to make disciples, to bring about a following to capture someone's interest and their heart. 
We're blessed to have Miss Ruthann Robinson here at First Baptist Church and Bridgeport Baptist Academy. When she came in here uh, and came to teach for us and work for us, she came in with a mission, and that was to make disciples of music. And she's done a phenomenal job, has she not? If you're at the spring program, elementary spring program, you saw multiple students. You saw a band over here, and you saw a violin and, and string students over here. You saw a small girl play, and you saw kids sing and do these things. And she, and she has worked on making new, new, new musicians. You'll see some in our church orchestra when they get to a certain level and can read music at a certain uh, a expert level. Then they can join our orchestra. She's trying to make disciples of, of music to glorify the Lord. And when, when I see this, this commission, the expectation of Jesus Christ is to have us help make disciples. And I'll be clear about something. The beginning of this is salvation. But that's not the end. That's not the end. If I give someone the gospel and they gloriously respond and pray and ask Jesus to save them, my job is not done. My job has just begun. My job is not done. My job has just begun because the Great Commission is not just to go and see everyone saved. The Great Commission is to go and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. They can't be a disciple if they're not saved. That's obvious. They can't be a new creation if they haven't been born again. But the explanation is to go and make disciples. The first step that the Scripture tells us is to follow in baptism. That's the first step of obedience to our Lord. Baptize means to immerse. In different places, different church um, polities, they will sometimes present a different method of baptism. They'll say, listen, you can sprinkle somebody. And I've been asked, well, why do you as Baptists, why do you baptize? Where'd that word, where'd that word come from? The, the word baptize actually comes straight out of the Scripture. The word in Greek is baptizo. They did not have an English word at that time. So they actually took the Greek word baptizo and they made an English word baptism. Introduced a new word to the English language to baptism. They said, well, 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 why do you baptize it by immersion? Meaning, do you go under the water and come back up? Well, let me give you some reasons why we do it that way. First of all, we see the example in Scripture. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. The Bible says that he went down into the Jordan River and then came up out of the Jordan River. Now, help me here. If you're going to get sprinkled, did you have to go into a river? No. The Scripture could have said, and John walked him with a cup of water and baptized him. But he didn't. So why did Jesus go into the water to make it easier to sprinkle? Or because something else happened. All right? That word baptizo and used in other literature besides the Bible it was a common Greek word. It was used in one instance to illustrate cucumbers and the pickling process, making pickles. Now this is intriguing to me. I've had pickles. I love pickles. I've never seen anyone make pickles like this. It'd take a long time for those cucumbers to pickle if you just sprinkle them. They have to be dunked in something, correct? Right? Baptizo, baptism, to immerse. Lastly is this, is that it illustrates the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. Death, burial, and resurrection. That's baptism. And the scripture says, listen, not only are you going to go everywhere and reach all nations, you're going to see them saved, and I want them to see, to see them baptized to follow me in obedience, to illustrate what I've done for them, to, to make an identity with me. That's baptism. Pastor Let often uses illustration, I love it, uh, and that is of a wedding ring. I have one on my, on my ring finger of my left hand. This ring does not make me married. I could take this ring off, maybe. Ugh, there we go, got it off. Am I still married? My wife will tell you, yeah, hang this picture, you're still married. <laughs> Honey, I don't have a wedding ring on. I don't care what you have on your finger, get over here and hang this picture, right? But this ring identifies me. Oh, that man is married. Who is the unlucky lady? My wife. <laughs> Baptism does not save us. Baptism identifies us with Jesus Christ. There are certain cultures where baptism is a bigger identification than in America. In America, you can get baptized, and people say, oh, that's neat, you got baptized. 
There are other cultures where if someone were to be baptized, they are now shedding every false religion. They're shedding the religion of their parents and their grandparents and their uncles and their aunts and their cousins. And when they identify with Jesus Christ, they are excommunicated. They are kicked out of the family and the will. They are sent from their home. Identification. See, the Great Commission commands me to go and to make disciples. First of all, I have to follow in baptism. Then I have to follow in obedience, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Now, now think about this. He's talking to the disciples. They would have thought, well, of course, you command us to do a lot of things. They would, have, they would have thought that, oh, you know what? Um, you commanded us on the Sermon on the Mount to love and to make peace and to, and to love my enemies and pray for them and to, to do good. And, and, and they would have given me lots of instructions. They, they would have thought, well, you know what, Lord, you commanded me to do um, other things. You commanded me to, to be salt and light. But you see, Jesus said, you're supposed to follow me. And these people that you're going to win to, the, to, to me and the people you're going to make disciples are going to follow and keep what I've told you to do. They would have thought about this in Matthew chapter 6, to, to seek first his kingdom. You see, after someone gets saved, they ought to seek first God's kingdom. How to give and give sacrificially. How to live in the power of the Holy Ghost. See, what that means is, now with, with my obligation... As I go to make disciples, I now want to teach them to live like I'm supposed to live, like Jesus Christ. Learn how to, the Bible says, walk in the Spirit. Learn how to pray. Jesus gave us an example of that, and maybe you saw this past week that the Pope has changed the Lord's Prayer. Boy, I won't stay here long, but... but I'm glad that we don't have the power to change what the Lord says. All right? Now, sometimes I want to. Lord, I, I want this to be a command. Right? And sometimes we do change it in our life, okay? But the Pope changes the Lord's prayer? Unbelievable. Jesus didn't say change what I said. He said, keep what I said. Follow what I said. What to follow? All things I've commanded you. I'm sure later on they begin to think back on the teachings of Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, this is what he meant. I was reading my devotions this past week and came across this. Sometimes the Bible makes me laugh. This is one of those times when there's a, a time when the disciples can't cast out a demon. Can't do it. They, they bring this, this, uh, this person to Jesus Christ and, and, uh, and, and he casts them out of this young man and, and the, the demon is, is frothing and, and, and tearing the young man apart and they think he's dead but, but Christ raises him up again. And, and the disciples ask, they said, you know, why couldn't we cast out that demon? And Jesus said, well, because this, for, uh, this kind cometh forth only by prayer and fasting. Maybe you remember that passage of scripture. This, this kind cometh forth only by prayer and fasting. What made me chuckle was that Jesus said, this particular problem only needs prayer, needs prayer and fasting. But he had just solved it with neither of those two things. He just solved it. Because Jesus can solve any problem any way he wants to. All right, I'm like, yes, right, you're Lord. What do we do? We follow Jesus. So not only do I see an expectation of this commission and an explanation of this commission, I see the equipping of this commission. Is it just that, all right, we're going to go together, right, First Baptist Church, and we'll have a soul winning time, we'll get out there, and let's go, let's go, everybody get out there. Or is it that something else is going before us? Is it that something else brings some power to the situation? Is it that perhaps under the hood there's a huge motor that's energizing this whole operation? Well, the Bible tells us a few things. Jesus says it here. He says, and lo, the end of verse 20, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The first thing I see is God's presence. Until this place is gone, until this world is gone, until the end of the world, until the end of the age, until time ceases to exist, I will be with you. That's the equipping promise of the Great Commission. God, it seems too hard. 
but Jesus is energizing. Jesus is the motor that ought to drive this whole operation. He never runs out of gas. He never comes up short. Ah, we're men. Men, we like a fast motor in the car. You want to go in the passing lane and step on the gas pedal and, and see this thing just jump. But what do they make now? They make four-cylinder vehicles. Oh, man. That's like half a motor, right? Man, need some get up and go. And what do they say? But it's great fuel economy. Not when I'm driving 150. No, don't drive 150. Don't go that fast. I've rented a car before, a small car, and you're like, oh, it's a great price. And then you realize nothing is worth this price. I could put my feet out of the car and make this go faster than this car I'm in right now. I feel like Fred Flintstone. But can I tell you something? You will never feel that way with the power of God in your life and his presence. He says, lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the world or the age. Not only have God's presence, we have his power. I read you verse 19 and 20 this morning. If you're still in that scripture, look at verse 18. I did not read that verse at the beginning. But he began this whole commission with this phrase in verse 8. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. You see, God promises to empower this great calling. The great commission. Go make disciples. Teach all nations. We're going to see them baptized and identify with Jesus Christ. Then they're going to grow. They're going to follow me and what I've taught. And I'll empower this. I'll energize it. Truth is, with Christians 2019, some need to be sent to the mission field. Some need to send, but all need to obey. Some need to be sent, some need to send, but all need to obey. If you're to keep on reading and go through Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and come to the book of Acts, you would begin to read what happened when these 11 now disciples got energized by the power of God on their life, took seriously the Great Commission. You read about a day called Pentecost, and you, if you read past that, you'll come to Acts chapter 17. If you read chapter 17, you'll read about some men and women who have witnessed and tried to make disciples. If you come down to verse number 6 of Acts chapter 17, you read a phrase that I hope will be true again for First Baptist Church. That I hope will be true for saints and Christians everywhere. And the Bible says, and when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying. And it was this testimony of these Christians, these that have turned the world upside down. I read that phrase about those Christians, those early Christians who turned the world upside down. And I don't think of a spiritual hermit. I don't think of a group of men and women who just came and sat and went back home and lived in their own little bubble. I don't think of a, a group of men and women who just, who just tried to live a, a good life for Jesus Christ. But I see men and women who are touched by the Spirit of God empowered by the power of God, giving the gospel of God to everyone they met, trying to have everyone become a Christian and obey what Jesus commanded, fulfilling the Great Commission. It's Missions Month. Where does it start? Right here. It starts right here. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, you've called us to something great. Lord, you've called us to fulfill something that is a legacy. Lord, we can only do it by your help and strength and grace. I wonder who would say this morning, Pastor Howell, as you were speaking, God spoke to me. Maybe I've heard the Great Commission, these verses, I've memorized them perhaps, or maybe I've never heard them before, but as you were speaking, God spoke to me, and I don't have that heartbeat of Jesus. I don't work in the commission the way that Jesus would have me to. Would you pray for me this morning?
that I would fulfill the commission of Jesus Christ in my life. Say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? Raise that hand up. Amen. 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 Would you pray for me? Lord, touch my heart this morning. Pray for me. Amen. 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 I wonder if there's one here today who would in your heart know that if you were to die today, you wouldn't go to heaven. You've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you've tried to live a good life. Maybe you've even been baptized. But you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. We'd love to pray for you and open the Bible and show you how you can trust Christ. Who would say, Pastor, when you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. I'd like to know. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for the others? I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. I'd love to pray for you this morning. I had someone like that this morning. Amen. I see the hand. Are there others? Amen. Amen. Lord, you've seen these hands and you've, you know our hearts. Lord, may we not be lackadaisical. Lord, may we not be light in what you've challenged us and charged us to do. Lord, help our hearts to be tender to you in Jesus' name.